What does it take to heal the mind? The question isn't easily answered, but some clues are found in the lives and accomplishments of healers throughout history. Author Kay Redfield Jameson turns her lens on war poets and healers in her new book, Fires in the Dark, Healing the Unquiet Mind. If you've got a mental illness, I think that one of the things that um, is important is you have somebody who's accompanying you, and that is the notion of a psychotherapist. And that person can't take your pain away, but they can be there for you. From the stories of doctors who treated devastated soldiers after World War I, to heroes who journey bravely into the unknown, to artists and performers who have gifted us with works that provide solace, Jameson has written what she calls a love song to psychotherapy. Kay Redfield Jameson, thanks so much for being here today to talk about Fires in the Dark, Healing the Unquiet Mind. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you. Your book, I, I think I read somewhere that a quote from you that it was a, a love letter or a love song to psychotherapy. Can you explain a little bit about that? What's why you wanted to write about healers and psychotherapy specifically? Partly just because I think that when people do psychotherapy well, it's an amazing thing. And when they don't do it well, it's pretty awful or very disappointing. And I've been struck over the years just how wonderful it could be. And certainly my own experience feeling very much it kept me alive. But when I wrote a book about my own experience with bipolar illness, um, I knew at that time I would have to stop practicing as a psychotherapist and I missed it. So uh, somewhere along the line, I thought I'm gonna get back and look at it from a very different perspective of what it is, what's the history of it, how far back does it go? And it turns out it just goes back way, way, way into antiquity to magic and religion and, and uh, the oldest branch of medicine. So I, I, I got very intrigued with it. So it, it's a book about healing, psychological healing and healing suffering and, and so forth, but it's also about people who are great healers. Yes, you focus on the healers. And uh, early on, it starts off with some um, rather innovative, I guess, psychotherapists after World War I. The men who fought in that war were so damaged. Right. And, and several of the psychiatrists, uh, in, particularly in Britain, who were, had read and ha had learned about psychotherapy, the very beginning of modern psychotherapy, Jung and Freud and so forth, found themselves on the battlefields with hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers who had shell shock, um, perhaps mis misnomer, but properly known as shell shock. And so they had to come up with some sort of pragmatic psychotherapy that would be helpful to these young men who were just devastated by the war. And then what happened was actually one of the major people involved in that, who was an anthropologist as well as a psychiatrist, W.H.R. Rivers, because his background in science was so strong, he was able to persuade people in medicine to take psychotherapy seriously as a branch of medicine. It really hadn't been done that way. The British doctors had been very skeptical about psychotherapy. And so it was an interesting time, horrifying time, but an innovative time. You write much about um, Rivers as well as William Osler, mm -hmm. who his sort of, I guess, practices that he developed during that have kind of lived on, haven't they, in the field? Yes, I mean, he, he was, Osler, both of them are terrific physicians for different reasons. Uh, Osler has had a lasting impact because he was famous as a pathologist, and he made substantial contributions to medicine. But he also was the first physician-in-chief at Johns Hopkins, where he really made a huge impact to this day on how people think about medicine, how people think about healing, how people are obligated to do the best they can for patients, and not just kind of lip service, but really meaning that. There's lithium, which works on the brain, and I think you say gives you life, versus psychotherapy, which is a sanctuary. Big difference between the two. Right, I would say that it's the combination that's mm -hmm. probably powerful. I mean, certainly in my own case, in the case of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, if, I, if I were not taking lithium, I would not be alive. It's just that simple. I would, I would be dead or insane on the back wards. Um, 
but it doesn't do you any good to have a medication that works if you don't take it. And for a lot of people who are taking psychiatric medications, the problem is taking it on a consistent basis or taking it as prescribed. And likewise, um, you know, if you get psychotic and manic or suicidally depressed, you have a lot to live with, um, not just during that time where you really need psychotherapy, but you need it to face the future and, and deal with what you've been through and how you're going to deal with, with things to come. And I think in that case, it's the combination that really saves so many people's lives. Can you talk a little bit about your own journey through that? We call it bipolar, sometimes called manic depression. I was 17 years old and a senior in high school when I first got suicidally depressed. I'd been flying high, but not manic, wildly manic, I'm not psychotic. And I had no idea what was going on. I was usually, you know, extroverted, hail fellow, well met, athletic. I mean, the whole business. I never spent a moment thinking about death and certainly not suicide. I mean, just incomprehensible to me. Uh, I loved life. And all of a sudden, I, I wanted nothing but to die. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't read. And nobody really talked about depression at that time. I mean, I certainly had it in my family. It's a genetic, very genetic illness. Um, but people didn't talk about it. And um, so I went bounding along, up and down, up and down, and uh, so clearly recovered from that. And then when I joined the the UCLA faculty as an assistant professor in psychiatry, I went ravingly psychotic, ravingly manic, just completely over the top, hallucinating, delusional. So it was a medical em emergency, which was fortunate in the sense that it really forced me to get treatment. I didn't have any choice. Uh, and fortunately, I got a superb doctor. And it was a doctor I knew and trusted, who was a humanist as well as a very good psychopharmacologist, as well as just an overall good doctor and psychotherapist. And so I was very, very lucky. I was running a very large clinic at UCLA of people with depression and bipolar illness patients. And um, we had a focus you know, equally on medication and psychotherapy, but we, we required that the residents teach, treat everyone in psychotherapy as, as well as on medications, or most of them. Um, and I had a large, you know, number of patients. And I always told whatever doctors I was working with that I had this illness. Mm -hmm. And that it was, if I got sick again, they could go talk to whomever. You know, they could talk to the chairman of my department. They could talk to my psychiatrist to get more information. You can't hold people hostage to your illness. And you can't, and there are a lot of legal issues, ethical issues, moral issues. Um, and fortunately, they didn't have to do that, but they could have. But I, like about 50% of people who have bipolar illness, I stopped taking my medication after a while, uh, raving the manic. So, it's, I mean, it just it went on a course for a while. And then, was, then I finally just took it on a regular basis. And I really haven't had much problem since. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a rocky course. It's, it's a hard, hard illness to live with. And you say that several times in your book and quote other people saying, it's hard. This is very hard. It's absolutely true. I mean, I spend a lot of my time, uh, because the average age of onset of bipolar illness is about 18 or so, uh, on college campuses and talking with kids. And I say, you know, it's treatable. You can get through it, but it's really hard. And just, you know, this idea of a kind of a puffy, soft world and everybody coming in and bailing you out, not going to happen. You know, you're going to have to deal with this, hopefully with really good help, but it is hard. Because I think if you tell somebody it's hard, it makes it possible. I didn't stop practicing until I wrote a book about my illness. And it was the fact that I'd written a very private book and felt very strong that patients you know, need to talk about themselves, not wonder about their shrink. That book was a big step for you, I would imagine, to come out and be very public about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could say that. Uh, yeah, partly it wasn't perhaps done so much, although certainly people had written memoirs before, but not a professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins in that sense. You know, that, that it, all the jokes about who's in charge of the asylum and, you know, uh, I. I knew I was opening up. There are a lot, of, again, there are a lot of legal and ethical issues about it, and 
I had huge support from my department chairman at Johns Hopkins and the president of the Johns Hopkins Hospital, who just were incredibly supportive. So I was, I was lucky in that sense. They sort of cut my back. And I'm sure that story that you told helped a lot of people. Do you feel that way about it? I hope so. I hope so. I think I think that one of the hardest things is, you know, I was thinking about my mother, who's actually originally from Missouri. Uh, I mean, she was very normal. I don't think ever had a, a gloomy day in her life. You know, she was very kind, wonderful, understanding, intelligent, marvelous woman, but she was not inclined to moods, whereas she had a husband and two daughters, all of whom had bad forms of, of bipolar illness. You know, she was kind of uh, in completely over her head, you know, and when I wrote my book, I wanted people to understand, both people who have the illness, but people who care about the people who have the illness, to try and understand what it feels like to be manic, why you're so irrational to stop medication, which is very hard for people who are rational to understand. It's hard, these things are hard. Um, they're interesting and intriguing, but they hit families like a ton of bricks. And so here, in this book, Fires in the Dark, you turn to the healers. Right. Telling us about a lot of healers, some of whom are in psychiatry and some who are not. Right, right. And I tried to ex explain at the beginning that it was really an archipelago rather than a straight line because it's, it's not linear any more than healing's linear. There's no way on God's green planet that healing is linear. He healing, you know, you, you, you're better for a while and then you get sick for a while and then you get better and you, you know, you, it's like a frog on a lily pad. So you, I just went to the people and the books uh, that had given me sustenance and then healers from the past who, who were great healers. So William Osler uh, from Johns Hopkins in, and then he went to Oxford. Um, and and he, he had thought a great deal about healing and was a great healer by everyone's account, one of the great healers in medical history. Uh, but when his son was killed as a young soldier in the First World War, you know, how much healing can you do from that? I mean, it's complicated, and he pulled in everything he knew. He, he worked hard, which he'd always thought was a part of healing, which clearly is a part of healing. Um, and he went to his books and the things that had given him solace and friends and so forth. And it helped heal. I don't, I, I don't think anybody ever thought he got completely over it. I don't know how anybody would get completely over it. And then Rivers, uh, the British psychiatrist, uh, but also Rivers, primarily in the context of his relationship with the poet Siegfried Sassoon, who's a great English poet. And Siegfried Sassoon was really Boswell to his Johnson. He recorded what his therapeutic relationship was with him. And though he didn't describe it in great detail, it's archetypal in terms of a healing relationship. So I said, fair amount of time. They're both extraordinary men in their own rights in different fields. Um, and then I went to antiquity, Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, Romans, you, you name it. And they had very sophisticated healing systems, psychological healing systems, so that the, the Greeks and, and the Egyptians as well had dream analysis. They had sanctuaries, they had meditation, they had um, theaters, books, to read art and so forth. So very, people have been thinking about these things for a very long time. It's, we tend to be so modernly oriented that we think, you know, we're, we came up with psychotherapy, but of course suffering has been, and grief and, and, and mourning have been around as long as, as, as man has been along. So um, I went to, and spent quite a bit of time on that just because I found it intriguing to go back to the Neanderthals and try and figure out, you know, what did they do? What did they do for solace? The compassion, the solace, the consolation, confession, all these things are integral to the church uh, or religious groups are integral to psychotherapy. It, as Jung and Freud point out, you know, confession is integral to psychotherapy. Of course, I mean, you can talk about good psychotherapy till the cows come home, but yeah. if you can't afford it, if it's not available, it's you know, we have a completely broken healthcare system. So, you know, it's, this, is, this is an ideal form here. Not available to a lot of people. 
not available to most people. Uh, medications are available to a lot more people than than psychotherapy, because psychotherapy takes time, it's expensive, it's all sorts of things, and, and medications are perceived as being more effective, and they certainly are effective, but often the combination is, is more effective. You talk about Sassoon, the poet, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I gather that you also take a lot of solace in poetry mm -hmm. in writing. I do, indeed, and, and reading, and I think that one of the things I tried to put in there was you know, who are the exemplars, heroes? I mean, I, in, in this day and age, perhaps we've forgotten our heroes. I was brought up in an Air Force family, so my heroes were Billy Mitchell and Chuck Yeager and so forth. And, and I think having those people as your heroes, you, there's aspiration, but you're, there's also a recognition of courage and that you do things that everybody tells you you can't do, you do. And I think these things are important for people to have out there as an example. And, so I wrote extensively about King Arthur because he deeply failed at everything he tried to do. But he aspired and he cared. And he was a good man and a thoughtful man and a courageous man. It's like Scott's journey to the Antarctica. There, 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 there may be failures, but there's a certain aspect of valor attached to them. And I wrote extensively about Paul Robeson, who's sort of a personal hero. And he is a great singer, was a great mm -hmm. singer, very involved in the civil rights movement at right. one point. And he also suffered from bipolar, didn't he? Yes, and so they hospitalized for mania, psychosis, depression. But a, a great, great man. My father loved his voice, and so he was the first singing voice I, I recognized was Paul Robeson. And then I can remember my father saying several times that Paul Robeson was the most courageous man in America. And I, I didn't have any idea really what he was talking about until I read Robeson's life and just unbendingly principled um, and a great activist and someone who reached people through song. So he was the uh, most highly recognized concert singer in the world. His record as a Shakespearean actor in Othello is still unmatched on Broadway. He spoke 25 languages. He was an early NFL player, but um, all-American football player. Um, he paid his way through Columbia Law School by playing professional football. Um, and he was black, and he's, he was the son of a slave. He was just extraordinary, and he, he reached out to people through singing in the hopes that that would, and spirituals in particular, that they were songs of sorrow but they were songs that could bring people together and could get people through what difficulties were in front of them. And an amazing person, actually. And I think we don't reach enough to these people. Uh, I didn't know a lot about him. I yeah. learned so much about him from your book. Yeah. And, you know, that magnificent voice singing a spiritual, if that's not a transcendent experience. Absolutely. It breaks, breaks your heart in two. Absolutely breaks your heart in two, yeah. Yeah, so that was a real gift to the world for him, and as somebody who also had a, you know, a mental illness, so it's understandable why he was your hero, just reaching out to people. Yeah, and just the the fact that he had a purpose that was so far beyond himself. I mean, he 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 didn't just believe in suffering. I mean, he he was discriminated against. He just kept it in mind that his goal was to help people. And that's a, that's a wonderful example, uh, you know, it's just a, a genuine purpose. You write a little bit about Big Sur and Chesapeake as being places that you find a lot of connection with. Can you tell us about how that's healing for you? I think places are in general. I mean, partly because if you go back to places, you have memories of where you go. There's something about water, of course, it's kind of moody, broody in its own right, and beautiful and moving and changing. But also you see yourself over time. I mean, Big Sur, from the time I was 16 to now, uh, is a long period of time. And I, each time I go back, there's some cumulative aspect to it. There's some nostalgic aspect to it. There's some ruminative aspect. But it's a deeply meaningful experience. It's not just that it's calming or reflective, it's, it's that it's meaningful. And likewise with the Chesapeake, I was brought up sailing and continued to go back to the Eastern Shore a lot. 
California's Big Sur is so different from the Eastern Shore. And my father's family w went there, you know, in the 1630s or something. And so there was, there was Quakers. And so there was a, the Eastern Shore is associated with persecution and Catholics who came to the Eastern Shore. I mean, it's the same place uh, historically. And I just love it deeply. It's, it's, it's something that I, I encourage, I used to encourage my patients and still encourage people to, you know, just find those things in life and keep them with you, you know. Don't forget about them. Don't just put them off on a shelf somewhere. Um, well, your writing about both of those places is very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Very descriptive, the Chesapeake Bay with the brackish waters, you know, where it meets the Atlantic. Another thing I really loved about your book, you have some color plates in there that are so fun to look at. Oh, good. good and you good. have some that are maps. Yes. Which was a metaphor to me yeah. in, throughout the book. Right. Yeah, there's a map, I mean, Sigrid Sassoon, who was commanding officer of all these young men who were killed in the First World War and it's his trench map. And he was a deeply courageous man who won military cross and then ended up protesting the war because he thought it was so barbaric. Uh, but it, just seeing how complicated it must have been, if you're a commanding officer trying to figure out where on earth you were. And then the Wizard of Oz, my mother was a school teacher and she passed on the Wizard of Oz to all her children, school children and her actual children. And I'm passing it on, you know, to the next generation. And, it, and it's a map again. It's a it, it, what does what does Oz mean when you say the Wizard of Oz? People just think of the movie, but it, if you actually read the books, it's a it's a, kind of again an archetypal journey of this young Midwestern girl who's you know feisty and, and independent and kind of naive, uh, wandering through. You know. I had never seen a map of Oz before. <laughs> I know, you know, it's not it's not in the Oz books. There, there were a couple people who love Oz, and who put that together. Maybe even while the books were still being written, I'm not sure. Can you talk about how that journey? That's one we all know. Parallels the journey to finding wellness when you have a mental illness. I think adventure is uh, undersold. Wellness is talked about all the time, and that you sort of, in a way, coddle your brain, and you don't want any stress, and you don't want any difficult thoughts, and you know, and all to the good. I mean, if people, if that helps people, terrific, and it, it obviously does help a lot of people. But there's also a lot to be said to to being adventurous and going into deeper, more problematic waters. And I think that's what kind of the old-fashioned adventures used to be, and that's what great children's books are about. Of course, is that you go into somebody else's world and you are accompanied by someone who's gonna make it out because of character qualities or whatever. And if you've got a mental illness, I think that one of the things that um, is important is you have somebody who's accompanying you. And that is the notion of a psychotherapist and a good psychotherapist. And that person can't take your pain away. Uh, there's just no way. Uh, nobody can take your pain away. They can take some of the pain away but they can be there for you. And one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins said once, who was treating a very, very depressed patient, I mean, really, really depressed patient, and he said, I will never, ever, ever give up on you. You know, and it's that extension of hope and this sense of bleakness. So that's part of the journey is, the initial part of it is extending hope and, you know, kind of possible ways of getting there and that you will get there, and that it may be hard, but it's going to, at the end of it, and this is what I always tell students, is look, there's nothing good to be said about depression. You know, there's nothing romantic about depression. But when you get to the end of it, you can pull out from it, and you can learn from it, and you can help other people from it, and gain some purpose from it. It's not gonna be for a while, but you can. You can write from it or whatever, but you can do something with it uh, that can help. And that's part of the journey as well. Very much so. Um, I feel like, you know, you really um, give so many wonderful examples of how it's important to shine a light on mental illness, not be quiet about it, really accepting that in yourself and acceptance of other things that are part of life, like grief. Yeah, yeah. for sure. If we don't accept them as part of life, we don't ever heal from them, really. No, I think that's true. And, and one of the things that I had written about grief in an earlier book, uh, but 
I, I wanted to try and convey what is it that society can do to help. And so there was this problem at the end of the First World War that not only had millions of young men died, but 500,000 couldn't even be identified because they were blown apart and they couldn't be found. And so England had the problem of how do you in any way memorialize this? You know, what can the nation do? And a young Anglican priest went to the dean of Westminster Abbey and said we should have an unknown soldier. They took four coffins where the bodies could not in any way be identified because they were decomposed, so nobody could ever identify them, and put them in a tent. And the commanding officer came in with a lantern, and he put his hand on one of the coffins, and then that became the unknown warrior in Britain. And then there was this memorial service. The coffin was taken across by a British destroyer across the English Channel. In mid-channel, six other British destroyers met the coffin. So it was ancient. It was antiquity. It was the Peloponnesian Wars. It was, you name it, it was every aspect from myth and history and psychology that you could imagine. And the seriousness was, was, just, was taken, and then the ceremony of Westminster Abbey. But what it did was it gave a seriousness to grief, to collective grief, to national mourning. That is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever read. You know, it was just everything was done with a sense of moment and greatness. And it gave a heroic quality without in any way denying the sorrow. Uh, yeah, you also talk about the importance of work for people who are mentally ill. Um, just for anybody. Or for anybody, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, to be engaged in the world, to be active, to be contributing. Yeah, and I think for anybody who's suffering from any kind of uh, psychological uh, sorrow or grief, I mean, I think that, you know, some of the best advice I ever got was you're not going to believe this now, but work helps. And I said, you're right, I don't believe it. Uh, but he was absolutely right, and it, it does help. And, and actually, Osler's great point was that of all things that heal, it's work. And again, we don't give enough credit to work, but it gives purpose to people, and it gives them distraction and meaning. Okay, Redfield Jameson, it's wonderful to have you here today talking about your important book, Fires in the Dark, Healing the Unquiet Mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. The most important thing my psychiatrist did during that first meeting was to give me hope that I would get better. I didn't believe this at the time, all seemed futile, but his belief that I would get well and stay well continued throughout my treatment. It was undeviating even during my darkest depressions. Slowly some of his faith got through. His was not a naive or perfunctorily offered hope, it was clinically informed and seemed unassailable. His faith was persuasive enough to ferry me to the other side. He acted on the belief that the power of faith is one that a good doctor uses as a matter of course, and he used it well. <laughs>